So, <coughs> those people on the outside want to come in? It's a good idea because it's cold outside. Anyone inside wants to go out, you must be desperate to go to the toilet. Or you need to go home to go somewhere. But anyway, we can actually start the talk in a few seconds. <coughs> and as usual, I haven't got a clue what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Except sometimes I like to think, like, why are we here? Why did you come here today to listen to a, a talk? It's a lot of people come here. It's, I don't know how many people we have in the room right now, a couple of hundred, probably. And there's many more people listen online. And sometimes you ask yourself why. And one of the reasons to say why is that there is something which you can connect with people I think I mentioned this, or somebody mentioned this, I said the week before, this is all about giving you kindness. And wisdom is something you can, you can get from books, or you can get online. But this is not just the wisdom, and just not the words to describe what's happening in life, but just the beautiful kindness and generosity, the softness, which just adds the most important ingredient you know, to uh, the wisdom which we have, which we know. It's okay to think it that you know, but do you really know? Does it really work for you? Does this meditation, these attitudes which we teach in Buddhism, does that actually work for your health? Even just some time ago, I think one of the monks was visiting the, uh, the local doctor in Serpentine, and when they were visiting that local doctor in Serpentine, they saw an advert there for a meditation group in Serpentine. Not our group, but another group. And he said, well, why don't you come to our meditation group? And he said, well, your meditation group can't be that good because you monks are always coming into this surgery for help from the doctor. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing. But at least I can say it's been, actually not a long time, it's been almost never since I've been into the doctor to get any surgery or any stuff, I did go to get some uh, injections for COVID. That was only so I could travel. But nevertheless, and honestly, it's been a long time since I was sick. Why? There must be something about this spiritual path which can overcome this, these sicknesses and diseases and, and stuff. And of course there is. I just uh, remember teaching people over on the retreats which I gave over in Indonesia. I was in Indonesia last week teaching in Medan and uh, Jakarta. And it's amazing just how many people overseas you know, listen to these talks online right now and also who actually practice these uh, teachings and get lots and lots of benefits from them. But I remember some of these meditations which people do you wouldn't believe just the amazing effect it has on you, even physically. You are relaxing. When you relax, the healing can happen. A good example of that is that some people experience what I call hot spots in the body. And hot spots in the body is when you're meditating, you feel just a part of your body is clearly warmer than other parts of the body. Parts are really hot. And you wonder what on earth's happening there. And it's not that hard to understand why. It's not the whole body, but just a part of it. There's warmth there, much warmer than anywhere else. And all that's happening there is when you stop trying to control your body, try to make it heal, be just aware of it and kind to it, you'll find that you allow you know, the body's energies to go to where they're really needed. So if you have a problem anywhere in your body, quite often in those early days which I used to teach, people would complain about hot spots in their shoulders. That part of it was really warm. And I wonder why? And it was obvious to me that they've had some sort of injury there in the past and it has not healed properly yet. And if it hasn't healed properly yet, one of the reasons is is because you know, mostly fear and control 
which the two of them go together. <coughs> Once we establish fear, then of course we want to control things. We're afraid to let it happen, we're afraid to relax. But when you really do relax to the max, and I really mean that, sometimes you feel like energy accumulating in one part of the body, and it starts to feel hot. And all the time, whenever this has happened, you know, people come and ask you, I was really hot spot in my body somewhere. And I say, well, you know, just, is there any operations you've had over there, anything which has happened over there before? <coughs> and they say, well, yeah, how did you know? They say, well, it's obvious to me. When you can relax and let the body be, then it will heal itself. A lot of times we get in the way and we stop it happening. And another example of that, which I think I mentioned quite a bit when I was over teaching meditation overseas, there was this one lady once on a meditation retreat and uh, she was twisted around into such a contorted posture that I can't show you what it looked like. If I did, you'd have to take me to hospital too. <laughs> and somebody actually interrupted my meditation. I jumped around, look at that lady. And she was really, really heavily twisted. And I was concerned for her too. I thought, you know, if you do that to a person we're not against their will, that would just really torture them. So I waited for her to come out of her meditation. When she did, I took her aside and said, Excuse me, but when you were meditating, you were really twisted around in such an extreme position. I feel okay. And she said, yeah, I didn't know I was twisted around so much. I felt great. And then I felt stupid Ajahn Brahm, you should have known better. So the next question I asked was, when did you have your uh, car accident? I remember her response there was, Ajahn Brahm, at last I've got proof. You have got psychic powers. I never told anything about that. <laughs> and of course, it didn't have psychic powers. All it really was is just you knew that that was the most common injury to your back. And somehow or other, she had a very bad, she told me about it, a very bad car accident. She was happy to get out alive. And she obviously went to hospital many times. And then she started twisting around against, she didn't know what she was doing. She was in a meditation. She didn't understand that she was twisting around, the body did it all by itself. And when it twisted around, that allowed the energies to flow to actually to heal some of those places in her body which the doctors couldn't get to. And that's why she said she felt tremendous afterwards. And so I will always mention that to each one of you, if ever you're meditating and your body assumes a really weird posture, really strange, let it be. If your body is deciding it needs to do that to heal itself. And it works, it's amazing just how your body can heal itself so amazingly well if you let it. So those are many experiences and because I've had those experiences myself, they have some sort of injury somewhere, you can actually just, I remember just years ago falling off a ladder in the corner of our ablution block when we were building it over in uh, Serpentine. It was really a long fall, this is one of those very long ladders, fully extended because uh, it was um, it was actually a stupid thing to do, but nevertheless you fell off the ladder, or rather the ladder just lost its footing and went all over the place and you got caught in the ladder. And you know, I was just amazed I didn't break any bones at all. That night I couldn't sleep very well because my hands were just, I couldn't sleep at all because the hands were very, very painful. So I went to the doctors the following morning to have an x-ray and said, oh, nothing wrong there. I kind of knew there'd be nothing wrong because sometimes it's the way you meditate, you can look at a part of your body and heal it pretty quickly. So there's many stuff like that which I've experienced and other people experience to allow, what you're doing is actually allowing the body to heal itself. Now one of the things which I saw as a student, you know, when we, a student at university, I was part of the Psychic Research Society, so we did these really interesting experiments, because we really wanted to know much more about the world than just what happens in the laboratory. 
So one of the things which I remember seeing was this hypnotist. And this hypnotist, well actually that's a wonderful way, I'm not quite sure what our finances are at the moment. Uh, yeah, you should know, it's one of our uh, accounts assistants. But I always remember this story because this was a guy, uh, he was a, a new monk, he started a new temple, he found it very, very difficult to actually raise enough funds you know, to pay the bills. And of course, you can understand why, you know, when somebody just starts out a temple, people don't know whether they're going to last. So why should you, you know, give donations when you don't know whether it's going to be used well? So he went to see a senior monk, and the senior monk told him, well, try this technique. I tried this when I started out with my own temple. He said, on a Friday night when you give a talk, make sure all the doors are closed, make sure there's no ventilation, and make sure you turn the heat up. So it gets very hot and stuffy. And when it's very hot and stuffy, give a boring sermon. And the way to give a boring sermon, you teach it in a low tone, like a monotone, I'm teaching a boring sermon now. And <laughs> I'm sure many of you know what I'm going to say. And he said, then what to do? When your audience are about to fall asleep, get out those old watches, you know, with the, uh, what are they call them, fob watches, I think. Get one of those fob watches. Move it left to right, left to right, and hypnotize everybody. And once everybody's hypnotized, I say about 200 people in here, once they're all hypnotized, then you give them the instruction. When you leave, don't forget to put donation in donation box. No coins, no fives, tens, or twenties, only fifties and hundreds. <laughs> He said, I can't do that. That's illegal. And the senior monk said, no, that's just encouraging good karma. It's good for people. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he tried it. And he made a fortune that day. He had lots of, no, no 20s or 10s or coins, just 50s and 100s in the donation box. Worth a fortune. Imagine that, there's 200 people in there. Wow. So he decided he can't do that every day. So he waited until he needed some more money to pay the bills. And so he tried it again. He said, closed all the doors and all the windows, made it very stuffy and hot inside, and started giving a boring sermon. And when people were falling asleep, he got out his fob watch and started swinging it. But before they were hypnotized, he dropped it. And it went smash on the ground. Because it was a surprise to him, he said the word. What did he say? <laughs> I'm just repeating what you said. He said, oh shit. <laughs> and that's what people did. <laughs> <laughs> Serves him right. <laughs> a couple of weeks to clean up. <laughs> so that's why I never try that these days. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but anyhow, it just you don't need to do stuff like that. But in hypnosis, it was weird. And I remember just uh, seeing this student, and he was this uh, hypnotist. He had a long piece of wood with a four-inch nail on the end, and he said to this student under hypnosis, he said, "This nail on the end of this stick." is heated up to such a high temperature, it's red hot. And of course it wasn't, it was just ordinary temperature. A baby could touch it, easy. It's really hot. And then he touched this nail on the student's arm. And the student screamed in pain. I can always understand that. If you really believe it's hot, then of course it will feel painful for you. But what I never expected was to see on the student's arm a blister come up. A blister which was a burn wound caused by a nail which is at room temperature. 
That was impossible, but it was there, you saw it. So because you saw it, at the time I was just surprised, but I never forgot it. And I started thinking, if like through hypnosis, your mind can actually create a blister, why can't your mind uncreate a tumor? And I thought that, that was a bit controversial, a bit challenging, a bit extreme, but why not? And of course, it happens. I don't know if you've known anybody, I've known many people who had big tumors. And one of these guys, I haven't seen him for a while now, this was many years ago, uh, he had lung cancer simply because uh, he'd been smoking so much. In those days, everybody smoked. I remember when I was a school teacher for one year, we had a school rule that no one could smoke, and the, the kids complained to me. They said, well, look, every time we just knock on the door of the staff room, there's just there's so much smoke comes out of the staff room. We don't need to smoke cigarettes ourselves. There's so much coming out of your room. <laughs> I said, well, I don't smoke, but all the other teachers did. So, but anyway, he used to smoke a lot, and so he had a lung cancer. I remember him telling me that when he went to his doctor over in Armadale, the doctor told him, showed him the x-ray, you've got sort of cancer all over your, your lungs, both sides. Normally, we would do a surgery. But if we did surgery, we'd have to take the whole lungs out on both sides. It would give you radiation therapy, chemotherapy, but the best we can do is to give you an extra couple of months of life. Do you want to go for that? He said, I'll go back home and talk it over with my wife, which he did. And he went the next time and said, we decided, just let nature take its course. No need for chemotherapy or radiation therapy. But I think all of you, there's a few doctors here, you all know what doctors are like. <laughs> They will still give you another test every time you go into their surgery. So they decided to give him another test, another x-ray, I think, in those days. And he said when he went into his oncologist's room, the doctor was looking at the new x-ray, shaking his head. And his uh, disciple, he took one look at the doctor's head moving. He said, okay, doctor, you know, be straight with me. It's got worse, hasn't it? And that's when the oncologist said, no, it hasn't got worse. I'm shaking my head because in a week or two weeks, that, that's all. All the cancer has disappeared. I've never seen this before. That's why he's shaking his head. It's like the, the x-ray or whatever it was, was, was not working or something. But he said, it's all gone. George, what have you been doing? You know what George said? Meditating. Very good, carry on. That's happened so many times before. And I don't know if I told this one a couple of weeks ago, but this was one of those other great stories. This fellow over, I was teaching a retreat over in New South Wales a few years ago, actually quite a few years ago. And I got these complaints the first day oh, I was teaching this retreat. And that was a complaint about one of the meditators. Can you please ask meditators to breathe quietly? That's the only time I've ever had that complaint. Because this meditator was breathing, in re breathing very loudly. <laughs> I can't do it, my goodness. <coughs> so loud, it was disturbing others. But then I told everybody, that gentleman, he was like late middle age, he has sinus cancer. He's come on this retreat, he wasn't even a Buddhist when he came on this retreat. He's had got sinus cancer, he's come to meditate hoping that somehow it could cure his cancer. You try anything if you're afraid of dying, and it's very close to dying. So he was breathing in loudly all the time, all nine days of the retreat. On the last day of the retreat, it always happens the last day. That's why I prefer short retreats, because the last day comes quicker. <laughs> but anyhow, <coughs> that 
the last day of the retreat, he came riding towards me. I was in the car, uh, almost going off to uh, to Sydney Airport to come back to Perth. And he came, Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahm, please, don't go yet. He was really excited. What happened? He said, I was meditating, the last meditation retreat, last meditation session. I was meditating and I heard this popping sound. Really? And I could breathe through my nose the first time in months. But then after one minute, it closed up again. And I thought, you left it too late. But nevertheless, carry on. And he did carry on. Only one minute of being able to breathe through his nose, but that was just such an encouragement. He carried on meditating. And it was six months later, roughly, another talk in another part of Sydney. And then this guy comes up to you. This happens a lot. The people come, do you remember me? You know, they say that even in Sri Lanka. They said, I was at your talk, you know, in Bandaranaika Memorial International Convention Centre, whatever it's called. I marked about 5,000 other people. Do you remember me? <laughs> they, they'd done that to me. And so I tell this guy, I don't know who you are, because I'm honest. <laughs> they may get upset at me, but you've got to be honest. And then the... <laughs> The guy said, I was that man who had the sinus tumor. And, you know, you've be seen people with cancers. You know, they look really gaunt, no flesh on their body. You can see they're dying. And when they actually get better, they look totally different. It's almost impossible to recognize them. He said, I was that guy. The tumor's totally gone. I just come to say thank you. Number two. I said, I've de decided to spend the rest of my life, however long I've got left, t teaching what you taught me to others with cancer. His cancer vanished. It was amazing. So a lot of time, it's, it's wonderful what you can do with your physical health, with a little bit of meditation. It's miraculous sometimes. But it's not miraculous in that sense, it's just like that hypnosis. You can create a burn, a a blister on your, your hand or on your arm. If you can create that through the power of your mind, why can't you reduce the size of tumors and do other amazing things? But on that same subject of people who come up to me and say, do you remember me? I say, no, not at all. That there was this uh, other lady, actually I've just got to go a bit forward, I was invited to give this uh, seminar once on, on an education day over, I think, the Eastern Suburbs Education Department or something. They were having a seminar. They hired a nice hall and they said, Ajahn Brahm, if you come, we we'll give you a free breakfast. That was good enough for me. So I went over there for the free breakfast. And of course, as soon as I walked in, I'm not really sure why I was invited. They never told me. And it was like an education seminar. And the lady came up to me and said, Thank you, Ajahn Brahm, for coming. Do you remember me? That's why this story comes up. I said, No, I haven't got a clue who you are. And actually, she told me the story that about six months earlier, or maybe a year earlier, I'd been invited to give a, a talk uh, in Gosnell's, uh, I think it was a primary school. You know, that, I go to all these places to give talks, and I don't really get much feedback. But I went to this school and gave a talk, and one of the uh, stories I told was the old Empress Three Question story. Now is the most important time. The one in front of you is the most important person in the whole world. The only thing to do is to care. And that really hit her very hard. Just like it actually meant so much to me when I first read it as a student. I remember first reading it in this book by Leo Tolstoy. And after I read that, wow, I mean, that was powerful. And I just got up from my room and just went walking around Cambridge for an hour, just, wow, it really blew my mind, literally. So anyway, I did the same to her. She was a principal of a school, a very successful teacher. That night, she told me, after hearing me talk about that story, she resigned. 
She gave her a, up a job instantly. And then what she did, she knew that Gosnells was a, was a low socio-economic area at the time. There were many kids who had left school at a very young age. And she, wanted, she kind of knew what had happened to them. They'd run away from home, boys and girls, dealing drugs, prostitutes, living on the streets, underage. And she thought, I can't just ignore this. So what she did was, um, now's the most important time, she had to do it straight away. And she went you know, to these places in Perth, under the bridges, the places where homeless people hang out, especially underage. And she went to talk to them. But when she was talking to them, she didn't feel fear. Instead, she felt, you are the most important person in the world to me. You underage prostitute. You kid on drugs or selling drugs. And the only thing I'm going to do is care. How that care works out, I don't know. But just be kind. And she felt that she could now communicate with these people who were in immense social difficulties. And it was actually, some of those kids were at this conference, or which I went to, and they were telling me just how it was the first time someone was listening to them. They didn't have an agenda, they didn't want to try and get them back to school or anything. They just wanted to listen and give these little kids importance instead of discriminating against them or just just trying to reject them or bung them in a school, in a prison somewhere. She was listening. And when she was listening, you get that connection with these underage prostitutes and drug dealers and kids, 14, 15 year olds. She connected so well with them, she learned what they, the kind of things they needed, what kind of things they would need to bring them back into the school system. Not just an ordinary school, but being able to have times when they can come, when they feel they want to come, and to have lessons or education tailored for them, so they could feel that they were part of the education system, not something just given to them, but they were contributing towards it. And she got the funding from the education department, even when she went to see these people behind the desks in East Perth, still that she remembered now is the most important time and the person behind the desk is the most important person in the whole world for her. And she really cared and that came out and she got the funding. And this little seminar was actually um, celebrating the success of that program. I gave a talk but my talk was totally overpowered by the next boy who gave a talk. He told where he'd come from and the pain and difficulties which he'd gone through in his life. And then just under the bridge somewhere in Perth, this lady came up to him and was the first person who did actually listen to him. Not judging him, never made him feel afraid. What do you need? What can I get for you? you know, I, I have the resources to make sure that we can you know, get you some food, a place to stay, get off the drugs, get a career. And he gave this very eloquent talk and he said he'd got a place at university next year. <laughs> when he said that, it was amazing where he'd come from and where he got to. I said, I can't match that, whatever I talk. That was a real person who'd been really down, had bad luck all his life and somebody actually cared, listened, gave him that sense of importance. And now he was going to university, he's got his life back. And that was just one out of many. A girl talked next and she was just as good. So that's the sort of thing which these kind of talks can give. They were used in all sorts of different places, all different ways. And people like you adapt them, and make them work. When you come up afterwards, I came to your talk, do you remember me? I'll say no, I don't really care because it's you who have done the hard work and you're the, the, you're the uh, cele celebrity today. 
But always remember that, that innovation, just because you give a nice talk of something which meant a lot to you, and you inspire other people to do the same. That inspiration is what really matters in our world. Sometimes <laughs> you've got a bad leg or something. I'm just looking at somebody who was just moving their leg. Ooh, poor thing. You don't need to sit all the time in the same position. It's fine to be able to move and just to look after your body. Yeah, we do have rules in this um, uh, temple, but all rules are to be broken. That's what rules are there for. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, should I? Will I get in trouble? <laughs> A lot of times you don't need to break the rules because they they make common sense. They look after other people. But nevertheless, please, your compassion, the kindness is rule number one. Even in our monastic rules, if you don't know this, we've got like the rules set down by the Buddha. We've got the rules which we add from our monastery. And the first rule in our monastic system, actually used to be, a long time ago, the first rule was the abbot, the head monk, is always right. <laughs> and when the head monk is wrong, go back to rule number one. <laughs> but that's only a joke. The real, the real first rule which I insisted was put in there is compassion, kindness, overturns any other rule. That's wonderful in life, the kindness. Somebody has done something wrong, oh, for goodness sake, forgive them. Be kind to them. You don't imagine, you can't really underestimate the power of that kindness in all areas of life. Uh, who was it? Oh yeah, Anusha's here. I think you were there, remember, when out of kindness I fixed the boot of the car? So please tell Evans if I'm exaggerating the story. This was our youth group many years ago. And having you know, done the youth group thing here, they were going down to the beach you know, to enjoy each other's company. And I remember them just parked in front of our building over there. The parked car was parked, they couldn't open the boot. They'd been trying for like, half an hour or something. Why didn't you get the RAC? Sorry? So she didn't belong to the RAC or something. Okay. So she didn't need to belong to the RAC. <laughs> so they saw me walking down the road. I think I'd just done some chanting in the house around the corner. And when I came over there, you said, oh, here's Ajahn Brahm. He can fix the car. <laughs> it's not the RAC. It's the Royal Ajahn Club <laughs> or something like that. So I remember that. They just she came down here and Veronica... Uh, she said, I said, can you please fix the car for us, Ajahn Brahm? I can't open the boot, we've been trying for half an hour. And I remember <laughs> looking at her and telling her, I said, look, I will fix the car and open the boot of that car if you become a Buddhist nun, a bhikkhuni. <laughs> that was a deal. So she said, yes. It must be she never thought I could open it. So she said yes, and that really wound me up. So I, I took the key, put it in the lock. First time, just opened it. Easy. <laughs> and I put the boot. And all I ever did, honestly, was just loving kindness. Loving kindness works on, on locks and things, and machines. It does. I told the, this morning that story of years and years and years ago. These are all old stories, but they're really good. The old story about that small company over in Houston called NASA. <laughs> small company. NASA. They were installing a new supercomputer in their offices. Cost millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. The main number cruncher for the whole of NASA. And once they you know, joined all the bits and pieces together and installed it. They could not get it to work. They could not, but have you ever tried sort of a computer, something goes wrong and you can't make it work? It's really frustrating, but if it's NASA, that's, you know, it costs them millions every day, the computer's down. So they've got all these experts from the whole of North America, all the, you know, the big professors from all these universities, they flew them down first class to Houston, Nice hotel, please fix the computer up, this is an emergency. And doesn't matter who they got down, no one could fix it. 
I'm not exaggerating the story, this is absolutely true. No one could fix this compu computer. And so they, one of the, uh, the workers there, he was a tire engineer. And this tire engineer said, well if we can't fix it, I remember the story, if we can't fix it, perhaps it may be something supernatural. And I know the very person who could fix it if it's supernatural. There's a monk staying here, a forest monk in the Thai temple in Houston. And the advantage of monks is we don't cost anything. <laughs> Give us a cup of tea and we'll fix anything for you. <laughs> Good value for money. So <laughs> anyway, they got this monk into the uh, computer room, the main computer room, this huge uh, mainframe computer. And then all he did was meditate. He was a great loving kindness monk. A bit of chanting, that's all. And the computer, honestly, I'm not exaggerating, after he finished his chanting and his meditation, this big mainframe computer worked perfectly. They couldn't believe it. They didn't, know one, uh, didn't worry why it was working perfectly. They were just so pleased it could now work. And what can you give a monk? He doesn't need anything. So apparently what they did give him, we found this out afterwards when he went to San Francisco, and one of the monks there met him at the airport. One of the monks who met him at the airport said, look, can we just look at your passport to make sure you've got a proper visa? And they looked at the visa and they couldn't believe what they saw. His visa was a diplomatic visa with no expiry date. You come in and out of the United States as many times as you want, whenever he wants for the rest of his life. And this was a time of homeland security. And he was just a forest monk. Sometimes his forest monks, the immigrations and customs, are a bit dubious about you. When I was uh, traveling through the United States a few years ago, they looked at me, I'd, I've only have my, my bag, that's my baggage. I said, where's the rest of your baggage, sir? I said, this is all I have. He said, well, what's underneath your robe? <laughs> and what this customs agent said, we said, is that a suicide belt under your robe? Because in those days people would use suicide belts. And so I opened up my robe and said, no, it's suicide belt, it's only fat. <laughs> and that's when the customs officer said, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that story? <laughs> Suicide belt? Oh, no, it's only fat. Same thing. <laughs> but anyway, that, that was many years ago, so it hasn't gone off yet. I'm still alive. <laughs> but anyway, he fixed his computer. And, he got a, and I often, I said this morning, it's probably true, that the reason they gave him a diplomatic visa with no expiry date was not just to make his life easy, but if they needed to fix the computer in a rush, it, they could get him straight away. <laughs> he wouldn't need a visa. <laughs> That's weird stuff. Or is it weird? All this time, the power of the mind is incredible. And I keep sort of uh, playing around with that, open the boots of car. By the way, Ronnie never became a bhikkhuni, never became a nun. And the reason why was because in our... Um, youth group at the time, there was another member who was a young lawyer. And she came to Veronica's or Ronnie's help. She said, yes, she did promise to become a bhikkhuni, but she never said when or in which life. <laughs> so she got away with that. <laughs> Fair enough, it got me out of it, because you can't force a person to become a bhikkhuni or whatever. But the kindness there, it's amazing what you can do to create that sort of kindness and how that can help in your life in all sorts of areas when you really train in kindness it's amazing what it can do and it inspires other people not just to think, oh, Ajahn Brahm is special no, it just makes it that you can do these things as well the kindness which you have even to, again, machines Look, I was a theoretical physicist, okay, a hard-nosed scientist. You don't believe things without seeing evidence for it. But it does work. 
even just other machines like your car. I only mention that just with the locks. If you can just, you know, on a cold day, if you think your, your car's going to have a hard time starting, stroke it first of all. Nice car, kind car. I really care for you, car. <laughs> it's not a joke. Try it. Or your computer. Just stroke it. Nice microphone. A nice microphone. I don't know how it works, I must admit, but I've tried it s so often and it does work. And it's sort of kind of weird, but you know, you know that that's possible. So these little things, this, oh, uh, some other weird stories which I haven't told you yet. This was many, many years ago. There was one of the, the forest monks, a good meditator. It was the first time when he was visiting the town of Ubon. That's you now where I grew up as a monk. He was visiting Ubon and he went into a bus for the first time in his life. This was many years ago. And then he started thinking, I wonder how a bus works. There's an internal combustion engine. He'd never gone to school and seen diagrams of internal combustion engines. I wonder how it works. And so he started thinking about the motor. And as soon as he started thinking about it, the motor stopped. It wouldn't work. And so he stopped thinking about it and it worked again. He said, it's really weird. And then he thought about it again and it stopped. He was actually interfering with the firing of the car. And that became such a well-known story in that part of the world that when Ajahn Chah got on an aircraft to go to London, people said to him, please don't think about how this aircraft works. <laughs> <laughs> he might stop the engine, they were all dead. <laughs> So you hear these stories, and these are true, there's people you know. And that's why sometimes this is weird stuff which happens, and the power of kindness is not there for just stopping engines. It's there for making you happier people, healthier people. And all these other little injuries which you have, or frustrations which you have with computers or whatever, it's amazing what you can do. Never forget that. Opening doors, the doors locked and closed and you can't get in or something. Just be kind, as long as it's your house, not somebody else's house. <laughs> nice safe, nice safe. Please open up, I'm really poor. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> so anyway, that's a little talk for this evening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, now, any questions? Yeah, Eddie. Sorry, Ajahn Brahm. I thought of not talking at all, but then my inner self says, say it, you know. If you don't okay. say it, it's gone. You know? No, I'm, I'm just going to give you kindness so you won't be able to talk. Just <laughs> <laughs> now I allow you to talk. Come on, Eddie. Ajahn Brahm, you give a very inspiring talk, you know, about healing, about cancer, yeah. and how it can be, um, how, how do I say, cure the thing, you know. While you're talking about this, my mind, you know, was thinking about the 12 links, you know, remember? The yeah. 12 links, the law of dependent origination? Yeah. Yeah, but I was telling us, this conditions, that, that, this ceases, that ceases. Yeah. So it can be reversed, you know? Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, it starts from ignorance and the 12, the six sense doors, everything, the things. That. So that, like, like what you say, it can be, it can be healed, it can be reversed. Yeah, and it's also mm. the power of the mind. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, that's something which many people feel is just a brain. Mm. But then there's much more to a the th than life than just to a brain. There's a mind behind that brain. And that mind is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm. here we go. Question from Germany. Dear Ajahn, what is a good way to handle restlessness and irritations? And how do you put space between your awareness and the meditation object? Okay, you can just imagine you're sitting over here and you're watching s something over there, but just putting space between that, the two of you is not quite enough. In that space, put a lot of kindness. So in other words, when I'm looking at Eddie, I'm not just looking at you, I'm putting this big amount of kindness between my eyes and you. <laughs> See, it works. And so when you imagine things like that, 
while you're looking at somebody, you're looking at it with this beautiful kindness. You do that to animals in the forest. You know, like if it's like the kangaroos this time of year, in the summertime, snakes, ants. So you look at an ant, or maybe a bull ant, you look at it, but you don't just look at it, you put this beautiful kindness. Little ant, you know, I don't want to harm you, may you be well and happy, and I really mean that. I will never harm you. I did that f for a couple of years. You know that big A-frame over in Serpentine, still there? I built that and it was right next to an ant mound. And it was a beautiful place, but you're not really supposed to build a monk's hut next to an ant mound to disturb it. That's against the Vinaya. But so what I did, and I went there, did some chanting, wishing all those ants well. Please, look, I'm sorry. I will not try and disturb you at all. I'm going to build this hut without disturbing you. And I managed to do that. I never so touched that ant mound at all. And so that once that hut was finished, I was the first person to stay in that hut. And the ants never bothered me at all. You know, they could climb in if they really wanted to, but they, they stayed away from my, my hut. They went underneath it, they went around it, but never actually in it. Until one day, one of the Anagarikas there, they weren't being mindful, they drove the tractor over that ant mound. I felt so disappointed. And from that day on, the ants started to come into the kuti. And that's no exaggeration. Sometimes your kindness can actually do so many wonderful things. If you're kind to the group of ants, then the ants will never harm you or hurt you. And that's you know, afterwards, if you break that trust, of course they'll come in. So I've seen that so many times. There's so many other stories like that. So anyway, the restlessness and irritations, it's not just awareness between you and the meditation object. Please put some kindness in there. So you have restlessness. Why are you restless? It's because you're running away from you. I always mention that because for years and years and years when I was meditating, I'd always try and bring the attention back onto my breath. And that was wrong. I wasn't being kind. I had a terrible, re bad relationship with my meditation. I was trying to control it instead of trying to be kind. These days I'm kind to my meditation. If you want to wander off, that's fine by me. Just come back soon if you wish. I wasn't going to be a control freak anymore. Not with my meditation, not with anything. And not being a control freak, you were like a kindness freak instead. If you want to wander off, I don't know why you want to off, wander off my, uh, mind, but off you go. That's, after a while, I had such a a changed, beautiful relationship with my own mind. So we hang out together. And that's actually what it feels like, it's putting it in a different language. We hang out, we chill out together, my mind and I. Sometimes when you're meditating, you start meditating, well you got time to meditate now, yeah, come on, let's hang out together. And my meditation, my mind, we, we stay together, we're friends. When you see a nice, good friend, do you have to force yourself to stay with them? We made this beautiful old friend. And you just, it doesn't matter where you go, what you drink, what, what coffee or tea you have, you just like their company. I like the company of my mind. So once we have that opportunity, we're just watching my mind, watching the peace. We don't want to go anywhere. We're the best of friends. Almost inseparable. Restlessness doesn't exist anymore. And irritations, of course there'll be irritations, but after a while you're kind to irritations. I just was scratching my head, it was itchy. It's always going to be irritating somewhere, but you're kind to it, that's part of life. And when you're kind to irritations, you soon everything softens and the irritations get less and less and less and less. Anyway, the next question from Kazakhstan. Dear Ajahn, what is the difference between the mind, mental objects, and consciousness from the mind? During rebirth, which of these things descends into the womb, mind or consciousness? The mind is not a thing, but it's a process. It's a process of mental consciousness. The mental consciousness has to have its mental objects, but it's like this, what they call the stream of mind consciousness enters into the womb in your next life. 
And the one of uh, the disciples over in Canberra, or just outside of Canberra, died recently. And I was spending a lot of time trying to tell her, you know, how to die. You know, bad cancer for years. And when she finally did die, I, I was quite happy because she understood what I was talking about. And when she dies, you know, just don't be afraid of letting the body go. As soon as the body goes, and the dying process starts, you feel so much more free and easy. It's like an old car, now it's all pushed aside so you can be free. And you make what the Buddha called like the mind-made body. And then just go off towards this beautiful light. And somebody actually sent me, uh, actually her husband sent me a little um, uh, article about somebody else describing what happens. This is evidence from past life experiences. This is what happens when you die. You let go of your five senses and your body, and then all you've got left is your mind. You don't go unconscious. Just like that, mind is now freed from the body, and you can go uh, floating off towards the light. You can go and see other people, first of all, get other business done if you need to. Can I tell this story? Okay, yeah, I'm going to tell it anyway. The, that's where like ghosts come from, you know, beings who haven't finished all their business yet. And one of those ghost stories, quite a few years ago, there was this, th this Thai lady married to a Chinese man, and she never trusted her husband at all. So much so, she asked me, Ajahn Brahm, can you please uh, do the funeral for me and pay for it? And in return, we'll, I'll dedicate, uh, you know, my assets, is not that much, my assets to the Buddhist society. And I told him at the time, I can't do that. I can't do deals as a monk, but I'll give it to our committee. And they said, yeah, this is a nice little earner. You know, they're paying for funerals a few thousand dollars, but the, what we'd get from the inheritance or from the will would be worth much more than that. So we signed off on that, I did a funeral for them. And then after the funeral was finished, that uh, I did ask, the widow, George, said, have you got the, the will? He said, no, I can't find it, it's disappeared. And I didn't want to harass him, so I just left it be. And then one morning, that's when he came to the monastery, very early in the morning, George. I've never seen a man of any tradition so frightened. And he said, Ajahn Brahm, he came in a taxi all the way from, I think, Maylands, all the way to Serpentine, really early in the morning. He said, Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahm, can I give you this? What is it? He says, it's the will. Here, take it now, please, quick, now. And what happened? Last night, my wife came as a ghost. George, George, you know where that will is? Take it to Ajahn Brahm, now. <laughs> he was so scared. He was scared of her when she was alive. <laughs> she was doubly scared now she was dead. <laughs> So sometimes that's what you have to do, you just, uh, she was making sure her husband did the right thing, and then after he did the right thing, then she could disappear. Anyway, rebirth, which of these things descend into the womb, mind or consciousness, is a stream of consciousness. That's actually mind. <laughs> Question from Midan, Indonesia, that's where I went over to Indonesia. What is the benefit of chanting? Is the power determined by intonation or the good karma of the reader? It's usually the good karma of the chanter. We can give power to these chants. And of course, I think you all know some of the stories of chanting, which I've done and experienced. Sometimes you get very, we chant in Pali. And the reason we chant in Pali, not because it's got more power, but because you don't know what we're chanting. So if I make a mistake, you don't know. <laughs> that's, that's when I have done this. I was doing marriage chants for somebody and I got it wrong because I was too tired. I gave the chanting for funerals instead of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> True. And once you start, you can't stop. So I gave the chant. I never told them. No, <laughs> they're still happily married. It wasn't so much the words I chose. It was just the feeling which I had as I was chanting it. So that's where the power comes from. It's just the, the person who does the chanting. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, after listening to Dharma talks about old age sickness, separation from loved ones, I believe that life is suffering. It sounds so sad and frightening. How do I handle fear of future and be happy instead? It's never good enough. But look at me, I've been a 
Buddhist for almost 50, no, I've been a Buddhist over 50 years now, a monk for 49 years. Do I look unhappy? Do I look like I'm suffering? Do I look like I'm having a terrible time? Do I look like Ajahn Brahm should get a life? <laughs> yeah, there's old age, sickness and death. But the weird thing is, that once you understand the limitations of life, you can be far more happier, far more peaceful, far more accepting of the troubles of life, and still be free from them. That's kind of the weird thing. Is because you know when I was a young uh, Buddhist looking for a monastery to go to, there was many people. They never told me about Ajahn Chah. They never thought I would last as a monk. He said, "You're you're too happy to be a monk." And when I was a lay person, I was happy. I already knew how to meditate. <laughs> and so you were challenging. Yes, you can still be a good monk and very good meditator, deeply understanding, work hard sacrifice a lot, and a lot, and even be happier than people indulge themselves. What's going on there? One of the things which is going on, the real happiness doesn't come from not being sick. The real happiness doesn't come from getting what you want. The real happiness comes from the power of letting go. And that's why that sometimes the greatest happiness comes from letting go so much you get into these deep meditations and you put this out. Greatest happiness you can ever know. So yes, when you let go of what's suffering, then what's left is bliss. And you let go of that and it's even deeper bliss. That's why over in Indonesia, they always have this clip of me, well, something I said when I was over there years and years and years ago. My whole path in meditation, speaking personally, is learning how to get happier and happier and happier. <laughs> I said it something like that. And I was being realistic, being a good, true Buddhist. The more you understand, the happier you become. Until your happiness gets so great, it explodes and you're gone. The simile I gave, it's a good one for tomorrow when Ajahn Bamali is going to start talking about sort of the end of suffering, being enlightened and uh, not getting reborn anymore. It's like you are one of these uh, meteors around the solar system going round and round and round. Not just three times, but hundreds of thousands of times, millions of times, going round and round the solar system round and round and round and round, that's like samsara and the many births. But then once you manage to hit the atmosphere of the earth, and as you, uh, this meteor, as it goes through the atmosphere of the earth, it gets hotter and hotter and, and explodes in this beautiful uh, f uh, meteor, this like, star in the sky, it can light up whole cities, and then it just disappears forever. You go out in a blaze of happiness. That's the story of like an enlightened being. Not bad. Nice way to end things. <laughs> anyway, last question from Finland. What's your advice with dealing with repressed emotions? Thanks. If please distinguish between negative emotions and positive emotions. If it's negative emotions, repress them so much they totally vanish. In other words, you don't need to bring them up. In the past, for goodness sake, let them go, let them disappear. You can let go of the negative emotions in life, but the positive emotions, please cultivate those. You have a garden at home. You have weeds and you have flowers. Should you actually just maybe cultivate the flowers to acknowledge them, to emit them, to not suppress them, not repress them, not to repress the, the weeds in your garden? That's a stupid thing to do. If you've got gardens and there's weeds in there, just make sure they don't sort of grow any further. That's not called repression. That's called, I suppose, weeding, <laughs> cultivating a garden. But one of the best ways, instead of like pulling the weeds out, 
plant more flowers and water the flowers, water the bushes, and then the flowers grow. And soon the flowers and the bushes grow so great that they choke the, f the weeds off. That's like with your emotions. The emotions, don't cultivate the negative emotions, instead cultivate the positive emotions. When you cultivate the positive emotions enough, instead of anger, like forgiveness, that's really beautiful, kindness, softness, understanding, listening to others, being peaceful. Those positive emotions, they choke the negative emotions. It's not repressing them, you're not sort of putting them under a rock and hoping they would just disappear. You're actually dealing with it by cultivating the positive emotions, the kindness, the generosity, saying to one another, thank you for coming today, thank you all for listening to my talk. If you didn't come here, I probably actually would just talk to the microphone even if no one was here, but it wouldn't be, <laughs> wouldn't be the same. So that's with emotions. Distinguish between the positive emotions and the negative emotions and just uh, I suppose not uh, put out the negative emotions, but just, uh, I suppose, what was it? Um, just have so many positive emotions, the negative emotions can't find any water or any, any goodness in the soil. You've just got too good a soil for negative emotions. Why not? So anyway, that's my answer to that question. That's the five questions today. Any other question anyone would like to ask? Still free, no extra charge. <laughs> okay, yes, go on. What to do with them? <laughs> you, you say we still have negative, we don't need to run, I can repeat the question. We still have negative emotions, what to do with them? If you have negative emotions, it's just understand that the negative emotions, they hurt you more than anybody else. And so after a while you look at those, what's the cause of the negative emotions? A lot of time it's not seeing things uh, clearly. Things like expecting too much. So lower your expectations of life. When you lower your expectations of life, you don't get disappointed. All of you who come here every Friday night, please don't expect to have a new story <laughs> or a new joke. <laughs> Lower your expectations, they were golden oldies. I tell people, look, some people go to these concerts of the Rolling Stones, they don't got no new songs, they're just old songs they keep on recycling, golden oldies. People pay a lot of money for those. <laughs> so, if you lower your expectations, the negative emotions don't have much power. They start to disappear. I know it's, I say old stories, but I was telling this to somebody earlier today, the old story of the trees in the forest. Every tree in the forest is just bent and twisted and damaged. And they're beautiful, they belong. Every emotion you have belongs, so welcome them. And the negative emotions turn to positive ones. Can you do that? Look like fear. Is fear a negative emotion or a positive emotion? You reckon? Why do people pay a lot of money to go skydiving? <laughs> to, <laughs> to go on these death drops in fun, it's supposed to be fun fairs. I can understand why people do that. But anyhow, <laughs> You can turn it into a positive emotion. Can you? Yeah, give it a try. If not, then just drop it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not controlled by emotions, are you? Or do emotions, uh, do, do you control your emotions? Oh, okay. Like, feel it for, like, you feel anger, yeah. Be in it for a while, because if we, like, say to ourselves, no, I feel good, I feel good, then yeah. this anger will come later. That's right, yeah, you're being untruthful. But something like anger, 
You know, I thought of actually talking about anger this evening, but never got around to it. I'm pretty angry at myself for not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not <laughs> making it up. But I was saying to someone about anger, how does anger work? And I found that if I'm angry at a person, I can say, yeah, I'm not angry at you, but say, I look at the mug next to me, and I think, all oh, the things he didn't do, and he should have done that, why didn't he do that, he made my life so much more difficult, blah, blah, blah. And I realize that what I'm doing, I'm trying to justify my anger before I can really let it be. Out of like a trial you have in a court of law. And it's only the prosecutor is allowed to speak. No defense is allowed. And I'm also the judge and having Justify my anger, he didn't do this, he should have done that. I'd like I have a hammer, guilty. I deserve to be angry at him because of all he'd done to me. And these days, and when I saw that, I always remembered to have a fair trial. I can't get angry at anybody. Even, like, who's a, a person you should find it very easy to get angry to? Mr. Putin? No, Kim Jong Un? Who else? No, poor old Mr. Putin, he's trying his best. He's just had a, a bad sort of people around him giving bad advice. He's probably underneath quite a nice guy. Can you accept that? You know, one of the. Th <laughs> In that book I wrote about opening the door of your heart, I wrote a poem. No, I didn't write about it. I. I um, just uh, included a poem about a son's love to his mother should be unconditional. Now, even if your mother keeps asking and asking and asking and just so being demanding to you, you'd always go and try and help her no matter who she is or how she is or how many times she asks. It's a very beautiful poem. It's in that Opening the Door of Your Heart booklet. And the reason I put it in there was not because of the beauty of the poem, which it was actually quite beautiful, it affected me, but the author. It was written by a gentleman, a German gentleman called Mr. Adolf Hitler. And I put it in there because you read it and then you see the name of it afterwards and think, wow, that's amazing. People do have, all people have some really wonderful qualities in them. They're not all evil. There's not, I don't agree with anything called evil. People are sometimes stupid and they do the wrong things. But underneath all of that, there's always some beauty and some goodness. Well, actually, I'm from Poland, so I think, like, in this situation, I see, um, like, the world could see how people good can be because a lot of Polish, like, people gave home to Ukrainian uh, yeah. families. They're great, they're lovely. And so there's a lot of times, even when there's some Russian people who come here, they feel embarrassed to claim they're Russian. I feel so sad that people can't, you know, not everybody is just part of any bad things which happen to others. So a lot of the time, you just you can't judge. I always try and get a defense attorney up, try and find evidence. So people, you know, other people get angry at, I just can't an get angry at. No matter what they did, or how they acted. Because I found that just, I've done this when I was going into uh, prisons. One of the most notorious prisoners I ever met was, was Ronnie Cray. He was actually one of the Cray twins in East London. He was the one who was the crazy one. He was actually mentally disturbed. And he would do some terrible, evil things to others. But when I went to see him just before I left, he said, I jump around, just, you know, thanks for visiting. If I ever get a few quid, I'll send some to your monastery. He never did because he didn't have any quid. He was in, died in prison. But the fact that he was kind and generous, and he would have done if he could. That kind of shocked me because I was brought up to believe that these were really dangerous people. And, you know, even just some people call them evil. But I can't see that. 
inside a human being, inside of you and me and each one of us, we have the, the opportunity to be very wonderful, beautiful people, <laughs> given the chance, given the encouragement, or we can be really nasty people, if that is encouraged. So, do you like don't see any uh, bad on the world? Like you oh, see yeah. all the world as a good? And there's much bad in the world, but there's a lot of good in there as well. And badness doesn't just occupy just one human being. There's some good in there as well. That's if you can see that good in another person who's really having such a hard time. Then that good can come out. They can be wonderful beings. That's why s working in prisons probably was one of the, the major reasons for that. In those prisons there were some people who had done some terrible crimes. But they were good people. And then you learnt to allow them to see the goodness inside of themselves, which you know, they thought wasn't there, but once they started to see it, they became amazing human beings. Now this one story I told is because just teaching a retreat over in Indonesia. There was, over in Jana Grove, we were teaching a retreat many years ago, and we couldn't find a, we couldn't find a, uh, a cook for the retreat. So I managed to, to grab this guy to do the, the cooking for us. And he was a brilliant cook. He did it all by himself and he did a wonderful job. And at the end of the retreat, when we start to thank people, he disappeared, he'd gone. And they said, where's Carl? We want to say, say thank you to him. And they said, oh, he's back in Karna Prison Farm now. He was on work release. And I told people then that Carl was in prison for multiple rape. And straight away people said, Ajahn Brahm, you mean you let a multiple rapist come and cook for us for nine days? Isn't that dangerous? And I said, no, look, I know him. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He never did. He did those crimes when he was uh, young and involved in drugs. He wouldn't do anything now. He never did. But the main purpose of not telling them, first of all, and telling them at the very end, was to say just how, how unfairly do we judge people? Now he's changed. He's uh, paid for his crimes, well, maybe not paid, I'm not sure, but he's certainly just leaving him in jail to rot, it's not going to help anybody. But let him come out, he's, I think he's, where is he working now? He's got married to a nice uh, girl now and he, I think he's working, he's in the northern suburb somewhere, Osborne Park, no not Osborne Park, but somewhere around that area, a really nice guy. So is a person because you raped? Are you a rapist? Or your person done a terrible, 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 hurtful thing? All those years I've, I've visited jails, I often say I've never seen a criminal. I've seen people who've done crimes. But they're human beings are bigger than that. Never define yourself by some stupid things you've done in the past. Learn from them, never do them again. Grow. <laughs> I'm not sure I convinced you or not, but anyway. So, any other questions or shall we finish off now? It's getting a bit late, so I'd better finish off, I suppose. Many of you are my age and we need to go to bed. <laughs> Okay, so thank you all for coming and now we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha and then we can uh, either stay here for a bit longer or just go and uh, see what happens. Thank
Viva Demi. Suakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami. Supatipano Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami. 